We've introduced some topics to you in this section that we need to go a little further with so that you can progress on to inferential statistics. Let's review. We can't measure variables of interest in the entire population, so we select a sample or several samples and measure our variables of interest. We develop a research hypothesis for our sample, but we actually test the null because it refers to the whole population. Remember that a model is a relationship between variables. A couple of examples that we've used, weight loss and bariatric surgery, or a particular type of diet and ammonia levels in end-stage liver disease patients. We can show relationship, correlation for example, between variables using the Pearson's R. If you remember this chart, we can also talk about the strength of that correlation, and we can talk about the direction, positive or negative, inverse. And by the way, we've discussed correlation between two continuous variables. There are ways of correlating non-continuous variables. I need to point this out to you. Uh, in the, your book on page 92, there's a table and I have on my own table here, for example, if uh, let's say we wanted to see if there was a relationship between two nominal variables, such as gender and uh, diagnosis for a particular disease. We would not use the Pearson's R, we would use uh, the phi coefficient. If we wanted to know if there was a relationship between a nominal and an ordinal variable, we would use rank by serial. An example would be race and a stage of kidney disease. If we wanted to know if there was a relationship or a correlation between a nominal variable and an interval level, meaning we have one that's categorical and the other one that is continuous, we would use point by serial. Let's just go back to our branch chain amino acid diet example. We could ask the question instead of you know, how much branch chain amino acid or what percent was in the diet, we could say was the patient on the diet or not on the diet, so yes, no would be nominal level, and then ammonia levels um, can take any point along the number line, so it would be interval level. Let's say we had two ordinal level variables we wanted to compare or, or see if there's a relationship between them, we would use Spearman's rank, such as cancer stage and ranked quality of life. Two interval levels, which is what we've been doing uh, up to this point in this course, we use the Pearson's R such as blood glucose levels and hemoglobin A1C. We can also use SPSS to run more than one correlation at a time. This creates a correlation matrix, and you're going to get a chance to do this later on this semester. So here's an example of an SPSS output. If you were going to try to correlate several scores in different disciplines to each other, so let's say we have uh, a writing score here, and we want to know if it correlates with a math score. And we see that there's a 0.617 uh, strength of that relationship, and it is positive. It's significant because the P is less than 0.05. It's uh, quite significant, but it's a, it's a rather moderate relationship. This matrix indicates a weak positive correlation between gender, in this case female, and writing score. Very weak, but significant. What other correlations do you see in the chart? Could you, if asked, provide the strength, direction, and significance of those correlations? So you might want to go back and look at the uh, presentation where we first introduced correlation to you to be able to do that. We can take a correlation one step further than just showing strength and direction. We can estimate how much of the variance of one variable explains the variance of the other. In other words, how much of the, of the outcome is actually explained by the uh, relationship between the two variables. It's called the correlation coefficient, and we get it by squaring Pearson's R. Let's say that we run a correlation between the amount of weight lost and number of calories consumed in an example of a sample of 300 adults. 
Let's say that when we get done with our correlation, we come out with an R of 0.8. This is a strong correlation. If we square the R, we know how much variance is shared by these two variables in our model or our sample, which is 64%. That leaves 36% of the weight loss as unexplained. We know that many factors can impact weight loss, not just how many calories can we consume. Perhaps exercise, thyroid function, insulin efficiency, leptin levels, variability in basal metabolism, and many other factors could make up the remaining 36%. So the bottom line, correlation does not infer causation. Just because two items are related doesn't mean that one causes the other. And correlation will not explain all the variance in a model. We can calculate it, but it won't explain that leftover bit that we just talked about. Correlations, as I mentioned earlier, should always be reported in terms of strength, direction, and significance. So correlation gives us an idea if the variables in our model are related and the nature of that relationship but it won't tell us if our model or our sample matches the whole population. Probability testing will allow us to determine if our sample results can be inferred to the larger population. We are now making that leap into inferential statistics. Here's another example. We found a correlation between consuming a diet in branched chain amino acids and serum ammonia levels. Let's say the relationship was a moderate negative correlation. We still don't know if the diet, high in branch chain amino acids, caused a decrease in the ammonia levels. We only know these two variables have a moderate inverse relationship. As branch chain amino acid consumption increases, the ammonia levels go down. Does our model fit the larger population? Can we infer to all end-stage liver disease patients in the whole world that consuming a diet high in branched chain amino acids will lower their blood ammonia levels? We might be able to do just that by computing our outcome to a test statistic and determining where that test statistic falls on the normal distribution curve. If the test statistic falls in the extreme end of the curve, we know that our results were not likely due to chance alone. Our results are statistically significant. How can we do this? We can use the central limit theorem. It's a mathematical rule that allows us to assume when many samples are drawn from a population, the means of those samples will be normally distributed. So we can infer our results from our sample by converting our score to a standard score. It might be a z-score, a t-test, or an f-score. We'll convert that to the population based on where the sample falls on the normal distribution curve. We use the characteristics of the normal curve to determine the probability that a specific value of a mean will occur. 68% of cases fall within one standard deviation of the normal curve. Therefore, there's a 68% probability that the mean of any one sample will fall within one standard deviation of the mean of the population. Sample means will be different from the population mean by some amount. This is called sampling error. Sampling error is due to sample size and variability in the sample. Some sample means will be lower than the population mean and some will be higher. This is the standard error of the mean. The SE can be estimated when the sample size has at least 30 observations or subjects. Don't forget that wonderful number of 30. Of course, the larger the sample, the better the estimate. We need the standard error to calculate confidence intervals and we'll get to that in just a minute. So if you remember, standard deviation is the variability of individual scores in a sample. And that's the uh, statistic that we use, uh, or the formula that we use to calculate that statistic. Standard error is variability of means. 
in the larger population. And remember we introduced this um, formula to you as well. So let's think about characteristics of the normal curve in the large population. The mean and the median and the mode are all equal. It's perfectly symmetrical and the tails are asymptotic. We also know that the curve can be divided into exact regions. 68% of any of the values in our sample are going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of values will fall within two standard deviations and 99% of all the values in a sample should be within three standard deviations of the mean of the larger population. Stated another way, 34% of our scores are between the mean and the first standard deviation if you go right or left of the mean. 13.5% of the scores are between the first and second standard deviation. And 2% of the scores lie beyond the second standard deviation and only a half a percent of all scores will lie beyond the third standard deviation. So look at this chart. What, what does, can this tell us? A student scored one standard deviation above the mean. That means that this student performed better than 84 percent of the class. How did we do that? Standard scores like Z and T and F can be converted to an address along the normal distribution curve so that we can estimate the probability of that score occurring. Remember the lecture on hypothesis testing? We introduced a standard score called a z-score where we take that individual raw score, subtract the mean, and divide it by the standard deviation. So we simply convert an individual raw score to a z-score. Add 50% to the area between the mean and the z-score and voila, you have the percentile rank. Let's give you an example. Let's say that a patient scores an 80 on a fall index test at the rehab hospital where you work. The rehab hospital has kept records of all test scores of all their patients for the past year and they've calculated a mean score of their patients as 70 and a standard deviation as 17. We can calculate the z-score by taking that individual score, subtracting the mean, and dividing it by the standard deviation. And we get a z-score of 0.58. So if you think about that normal curve, 0.58 is an address on the x-axis of the normal distribution. But that score doesn't really tell us anything about how the student, or in this case the patient, compares to others in the class or in that sample in the hospital unless we convert it to a percentile rank. We can use table B1 on page 351 of your book to convert the z-score to a percentile rank. In this case, the z-score is positive. It's above the 50th percentile. So we locate the z-score 0.58 in the table and find the area between the mean and the z-score. You'll see it's 21.57. Add another 50% to account for all the area to the left of the mean and the percentile rank for a z-score of 0.58 is 71.57%. So a score of 80 for this patient represents 71.57 percentile rank. If the z-score had been negative, we would have subtracted the percentile from 50%. Stated another way, there's a 71.57% of all the scores on this test falling below a z-score of 0.58. So your patient's doing pretty well. Again, I referred you to table B1, and this is what we did. We calculated our z-score. We find it on the table, and then we look at what area under the curve corresponds to a z-score of 0.58, and we see that it's 21.57 of the area between the mean and that z-score. We add that to 
and we see that it comes out to 71.57 percent. We can also go in reverse. We can calculate a raw score from a z-score if we know the mean and standard deviation of the sample, which we do. Using our previous example, if we knew the z-score was 0.58, our mean was 70 and our standard deviation was 17, the raw score of x is calculated as you see here on the screen. We can also compare z-scores of groups. You simply convert all the scores to a z-score. The distribution will have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. This will allow for comparisons between z-scores of different groups. One other thing about z-scores, they are very useful in confidence interval calculations. What's a confidence interval? It's a range of predicted values within one in within which one presumes with a stated degree of confidence that the true parameter of a population mean will fall. This is determined on the basis of a probability value of either 95 or 99 percent. What we want to know is how confident are we that our sample statistic we calculated would appear in the general population. There are two very important z-scores to remember. A z address of 1.96 and a z address of 2.58 along that x-axis. A z of 1.96 means that all the scores in a distribution 95 percent will fall between plus or minus 1.96. If the z score is 2.58 this means all the scores in a distribution 99% will fall between plus or minus 2.58. How do we calculate a confidence interval? It's very easy. For the population means when the sample size is greater than 30, 95% confidence interval is equal to the mean plus or minus 1.96 the standard error of the mean. We want to calculate a 99% confidence interval. We want to be very sure that our sample is, uh, is within the general population, then we would use 2.58. So here's an example. Let's say we have 81 newborn babies. We calculate their average birth weight as 100 ounces and the standard deviation is 27 ounces using the formula that you see on the screen. However, we don't know if their mean weight of 100 and their standard deviation of 27 is comparable to all newborn babies in the whole wide world, the whole population. So our question is, what is the range or interval estimate for the unknown population parameter of newborn infants. Or in other words, what is the 95% confidence interval estimate for mean birth weight? So we'll know if our number matches to that of the population. Let's find out. It's very simple. The mean plus or minus the standard error, we say 27 divided by 9 is 3. So if we want a 95% confidence interval, it's 94 to 105. In other words, we can be 95% confidence that this is the true population parameter. In this case, mean birth weight will fall in this range. We said our average or mean birth rate was 100 ounces. And so we're 95% confidence that our, our mean would fall anywhere in this range. And that's it.